Okay, so um, yes, Monday we talked about first order deformations of closed subschemes. Yesterday we talked about first order deformations of abstract schemes. Today I'd like to talk about higher order deformations. So uh, once you know how to deform a little tiny bit, you want to deform more. So can I erase this thing here? Everybody see this thing? You can yeah. see that. See uh, students? Last chance. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and now it's gone. <laughs> okay. So we want to talk about higher order definitions. general problem is we have some, some object. I'll call it X0. X0 might be an abstract scheme. It might be uh, a closed subscheme of something else that I'm not writing down. Or it might be a line bundle on some scheme. Or it might be a vector bundle. Any, any algebraic geometric object that you want to study. We're giving it over our field K. And we want to consider deformations over an arbitrary Arden ring. So uh, I'm going to call it Let's, well, call it A for now. So the A is our name. And we want to look for schemes X flat over A together with a closed immersion of X0 into X. And we consider the pair IX. And as I mentioned last time, uh, there's an equivalence relation on these. Two of these are equivalent. So x i is equivalent to x prime i prime if uh, x prime is isomorphic to x and the resistant isomorphism phi that's compatible with the inclusion of uh, x naught of x. So that's the definition of we're looking for equivalence classes of deformations. Can you take the isomorphism over i? Sorry? You take the isomorphism over I. Over A. Isomorphism okay. over A. Yeah, of course, yeah. They're isomorphic over A. Yeah. So that's what we're looking for. And we solved this problem in the case A was the ring of dual numbers. So at A equals B, A, T, modulo T squared. That's what we talked about before. So now we want to study the problem for any argument. So uh, if you try to do that in one step, just the way we did over the dual numbers, is too complicated. So our strategy is going to be to go step by step. In other words, we'll start with a very small extension, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more, and a little bit more. So actually, the problem we're going to study is a little bit different. We'll consider the situation where we have, um, we have a, a, an Arden ring C. So C is going to be some local Arden ring. And supposing we already have a deformation x over c. So there's actually there's an x0 over k here. So supposing we have some Arden ring c, and now we're going to look for an extension c prime of c with a kernel j. And we're going to look for extensions x prime of this deformation over c prime. So again, it's the same thing. If this is flat, we're going to look for, we're going to look for a flat uh, deformation x prime over c prime is still a deformation of x0, and it restricts to x over c, and two of these are equivalent uh, as extensions of this one if they're isomorphic over this picture here. Now, what makes this useful is we're going to make an assumption on j. We're going to assume that mj equals 0. I should write you both <coughs> where m prime is the, local, is the maximal ideal here, and m is the maximal ideal here. Now, these are local Arden rings, so the residue field is always k. So if you assume that m prime j equals 0, that means j is actually a k vector space. So j is a k vector space. So in that sense, we're extending just a little bit at a time. And the fact that this is a k vector space allows us to compute. I think there's a, there's a word called a small extension and a small extension is if j is just a one-dimensional k vector space, but we don't need those. We can just work like this. So here's the problem we want to study today. Now, I should point out, first of all, this problem is already different in a, in a, in a, in a definite sense from the problem we studied before. 
extensions, we're looking for extensions B. Oh yeah, uh, what did I want to say? Yeah, okay, now I'm going to specialize in the case of, of embedded varieties, closed subsystems. So I'm going to study the, the B0 together with its, its expression as a quotient of A. So it's, this is like the embedded uh, closed sum, like X0 contained in uh, Pn, closed subschemes. So I'm going to study closed subschemes. And this is the affine part of it. So I have a B0, which is given as a quotient of a polynomial ring. And I want to find an extension as a quotient of the polynomial ring, so it's going to be a quotient of A of T, because D is just modulo T squared. T is just K of T mod T squared. So I, and I have this extension here. I'm looking for a B, like that. And the way we did it was the kernel was going to be uh, B0 again, with multiplication by T. And then there was, uh, there was A again. And then there was, yeah, you know, like this. And it's an ideal I prime that defines the kernel. So remember what we did? We took an element x and a, i. We lift it somehow or other. And when you lift it, because this is just a of t, you can write it in the form x plus t y. And then there's a y over here that's in, in i prime, in i. This y, no, sorry, y is in, is in a. Y is here. Y is not unique, because it can be different by something like this, but when you push it down here to Y bar, it becomes unique. So in this way, we got a homomorphism, and we showed that the deformations of B0 over D are one-to-one -one correspondence with homomorphisms of I, and it passes through I mod I squared, into B0. And this is the same thing as H0 of the normal bundle, if you like, of x0 and pn, uh, if you run it globally. Now, there's two things that are different from this situation to the one we're going to study next. <coughs> one is that when you have the dual numbers like this, that's actually just k of t modulo t squared. So there's a homomorphism of the k, but it's also a section, because k is a subring of d. And therefore, when we lifted an element x, we could always write as x plus t times some y. There's a splitting here. You've got A, and you've also got a splitting here. So that's one thing. And the second thing is that there always exists at least some deformation, namely the trivial deformation. The trivial deformation is defined simply to be B0 of T over T squared, which is the same thing as B0 tensor over K is D. So there's always the trivial deformation. And under this correspondence, the trivial deformation corresponds to the zero element in this vector space. Mm -hmm. Now, in the situation we want to study now, if we're given a deformation over C, there may or may not exist a deformation of C prime. There's no, there's no such thing as a trivial deformation because we can't tensor, C prime is not a C algebra. We can't tensor X with C prime over C. That doesn't make sense. So we have a new obstacle here. Uh, there may not exist any deformation at all. So that really, we have two questions. One is, does there exist a deformation? And two is, if there does exist one, how many are there? So that's, that's what we want to study. And uh, let's, let's set up that situation now in the affine case and in the uh, embedded case. So I'm going to have A. A is going to be the polynomial. Right? It goes to b0, some ideal i. Uh, and down here, think of, think of this, is, this is over c, and I've got a c prime, and I've got a j. So this, this all exists. I should write c, shouldn't I? Not k anymore. This is going to be c if x0 makes it. So I suppose I've got my, my, my ring b0, 
And then, of course, this is a polynomial ring, so it always exists an extension of the polynomial ring. A prime is just C prime of x1 of xa. And the kernel of that is going to be J tensor, ah, what I should call A0. So let's make a notation over here. A0 is K of the field, x1 of xa. And this should really be called B, not B0. And B0 is going to be B tensor, uh, C with K. So the original situation is going to be B0. So our B was already a deformation of B0. So the situation is we're assuming that there's some definition of deformation over C, and we want to study possible extensions here, B prime, to an extension over C prime. And since J, you see J has this property that MJ equals 0, so J is a K vector space. So when I tensor J with A, Strictly speaking, it's the same as J tensor A0 because it's a K vector space. So I lose, I, I, I lose, I, it kills off the rest of C and I'm just back to K. So this left hand column now lies over, over K or over J. So the kernel here is going to be B to J tensor B, which is the same as J tensor B0. And then there's going to be the, the ideal is going to be I tensor uh, J tensor I, which is I0. OK, so uh, first of all, let's just suppose there is some B prime and see what we can say. So the, as I mentioned before, the one question is, does a B prime exist? And second, if so, how many? So let's start by assuming there is some B prime like this. And now, instead of, um, I've already got one, so I'll ask, now suppose there's another one. So we'll compare one to another one. If I have another one, let's say B double prime, then there's going to be an ideal I prime up here and an ideal I double prime. This is a rather strange notation, but uh, the I prime sequence goes to B prime and the I double prime sequence goes to B double prime. So I'll do the same thing as over there, except that, um, well, there's a difference. Here, the X lifts, and I can write x plus t1. The difference is, I have an x here, and I can lift it somehow to an x prime, and I can lift it somehow to an x double prime. Now let's look at the difference. Let's let y equal x prime minus x double prime. So then y is an element, uh, where is y? y is an element in here, in a prime. But its image in A is 0, because these both go to the same thing. So y goes to 0, so y actually comes from something over here. Okay. Now, on the other hand, remember, x prime and x double prime are not unique, because when I lift x or x prime, there's an uncertainty coming from something in here. So this y is not unique. It's determined only up to something coming from there. But if I look at the image down here, y bar, I get a well-defined thing in here. So the situation is then that Having fixed one B prime, one extension, then for any other extension B prime, B double prime, I get a homomorphism of, of I, which factors, well, let's just write I into J tensor B0, write it that way. But you see, since, since, uh, since this thing over here is, is, is defined over k, this actually factors, first of all, through i minus i squared. And secondly, it factors through i0. So it actually factors through i0 modulo i0 squared into j tensor b0. And if we use the notation n for the normal thing, that's the same thing as, the, as j tensor n Zero. The normal, the normal, the normal module, if you like, hum I, am, I, I mod I squared into B zero would be the normal module, and I'm just tensoring over K with this, with this ideal J. So J is just some finite dimensional K vector space that spreads things out. Okay. So you see how it's different. We, we can't say that one exists, and there's no trivial one. But if we fix one, then all the others can be described by an element of this group. Conversely. Uh, and I'll let you figure this out for yourself. If you're given an element in here, 
if you're given this, this homomorphism, then you can cook up, you, you, you fix I prime and you're given a homomorphism, then you can define I double prime by for each x, you lift x to x prime, and then you add on a pullback of the thing in the image over here. And that makes an I double prime. So there's still, again, a one to one correspondence between the B double primes and elements of this group, but having fixed B primes. So there's a name for this situation. So we have the set. We consider the set of all extensions of uh, B over uh, C prime. This set, this set might be empty. But if it's not empty, let's call this set S for a minute. So S might be empty. <coughs> but if not, then, then uh, there's a group. That I call the group G is this group over here. Um, it's J tensor N0 acts on the set S. And it acts on the set S in such a way that if you fix uh, a B prime in S, then uh, the collection of things G acting on B prime goes to S. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the group G and the set S. And this situation is called a principal homogeneous space. So we say that the set S is a principal homogeneous space <laughs> under the action of this group G. So I'll abbreviate it PHS. And some people also like to use the French word, it's called a torso. So, torsor is one word that represents principal homogeneous space. So, you, you save, save chalk that way if you say torso. Okay, so this is already very nice, but it's a little bit um, more subtle than the case of the deformations over D, because first of all, they might not exist. And then secondly, uh, if they do exist, we, have, we don't have actually, we don't have a natural correspondence with the group, we don't have a principal homogeneous space. Okay. Now, let's consider the global situation. This was this was the local the, the uh, this was the, the local situation because I was studying Mr. Ring. So now let's study a global situation of subschemes. So I'll consider an x0 in Pn over k, and I want to consider uh, deformations of x0 as a closed subscheme. And I'll have the same situation before, 0, j, c prime, c to 0. And then over here is k and x0. Now suppose that I already have an extension, uh, a deformation of x0 over c, and I want to look for extensions x prime over c prime. So suppose, given x over c, and we look for extensions x prime over c prime. And in order to do this, I don't know, whether, see, locally, I don't know whether they exist. So I'm going to assume that, or suppose, that locally there's de there exi uh, deformations exist. So assume, for the moment, that locally, that means on open sets U in X0, uh, extensions of X exist. So in other words, I've got a covering of X by open sets UI. And I'm assuming that for each UI, there exists a deformation UI prime of UI over C prime. And once I assume it exists, of course, then all the other ones will be given by one of these elements of that group over there. So it's once one exists, any other then, if I fix ui prime, any other <coughs> ui double prime is given by an element of this group, which is h um, 0 of ui and the normal sheet n of x0 and pn. 
see, because the normal sheaf, it restricts. So I can, I can write down the, normal, the, the, the global normal sheaf, and then I just look at the sections. There's some section over ui that corresponds here. <coughs> OK, so, so you see the picture? Now we've got, we've got an extension over each ui. In order to get an extension over, over uh, all of x, we need to pass them together. Now we have a gluing question. isomorphisms on the um, intersections. Uh, actually, we're talking about closed subschemes, so an isomorphism is just an equality. So in order to be able to glue, see, th these are closed subschemes of Pn over C prime. In order to glue, they have to be the same subscheme. So what happens on the intersection on Ui intersect J? We've got two of them. We have, we have Ui prime on Ui and we have uj prime on uj, and on the intersection, we have two of them. Well, since we have two of them, we can use that principal homogeneous space over there. So associated, if we fix ui prime on uij, and then consider that as the base one, and then take uj prime restricted uij as the other one, these correspond to an element in the group, which is going to be h0 over the open set uij, of the normal sheaf of x to the n. Okay, so so th this is this is going to be an obstruction. You see, in order to glue, you have to have things being equal. If they're not equal, you have an obstruction. This is an obstruction tells me that it's not possible to glue if this thing is not zero. If this was zero, that means these were the same. If this is not zero, let's call this element alpha i j. If this alpha j is not zero, then we're in trouble. Okay. Now, uh, I want to. I want before I actually define the obstruction. I want to. I want to simplify this a little bit. You see, this all depends on a choice of open covering sufficiently small so that the, so that the deformation existed. And by the way, and what happens when there's three of them? If I look at three indices i j and k, then on the intersection i j k, I have um, I have three things. Let's say I took i primary on i on i j. I took j primary on j k and k primary on k i. Then what's going to happen? Um, oh, no, wait a minute. I should I should take. Okay, you got a little problem here, which I'm not going to solve on the blackboard. But uh, you want to show that a i a j plus i j k plus i k i is equal to zero. And you can do that if you, if you see, in order to find alpha i j, I have to choose one as the primary and one and the other as the one that's changing. So if I take this primary there and that primary there, then you have to sh show that, that actually on the intersection, I can take one of them primary and consider the other two, and then the other two add up. Uh, I'll let you figure, figure, sort that out. That's one of those things where you have to define things properly or it doesn't work. But anyway, assuming you prime that dot, this is zero. So in other words, alpha gives rise to a check cocycle. So alpha is actually an element of the check cocycle group of the covering u in the sheaf n x zero into p. By the way, I think uh, yesterday I had a, a check cocycle. I didn't really explain what that was, but I want to make this more explicit today. So when you have an open covering of a set and you give a collection of things like this with two indices in the cover, you know, on the intersections that patch together, that gives rise, that's a, a chain that gives rise to a co-cycle in the cohomology, the check cohomology, which is made out of, you know, you know well, I have to assume you know how to do check cohomology. So you write all the groups out of the open sets and the intersections and those maps and so on. So anyway, this gives an given element of H1. And then we use this wonderful theorem, which you find for this first time in Sayre's uh, Festival of Algebra Coy Law, right at the beginning of sheaf theory, and that is that for coherent sheaves on a scheme, this is the same thing as just H1 of x0 in x0 over Pn. 
So this says that the Czech cohomology with any open affine cover actually computes the sheaf cohomology as it's now defined by Grotendieck as a derived functor. So those different cohomologies. In fact, Sears' original paper, he didn't have derived functor cohomology, so he had to define Czech cohomology, and then he had to go through the laborious process of taking the limit over all coverings and showing that it gave the same thing no matter what cover you took, and that it gave the exact sequences of cohomology. It was a very uh, cumbersome way of defining cohomology. Yeah? Sorry, the J that doesn't appear in this. Oh, I, I, I forgot it. It doesn't appear because I forgot to write. Of course it's there. This should be J tensor. Everywhere there should be a J tensor. Yeah. Some other places? Now, what we really want, this, so this alpha is an obstruction. Alpha is an obstruction to gluing. In other words, it's an obstruction to the existence of a global deformation, assuming that there exists global deformation. Now, actually, this is, this is really correct. Because now the point is, we want to say that alpha is equal to 0 if and only if an extension exists. <coughs> So I claim alpha equals 0 as an element of this H1, if and only if the extension, global extension, exists. Well, one way is obvious. Because if a global extension exists, I just take its restriction to all the different UIs. They agree with each other. And all these elements alpha ij are already step by step of 0 in the check cohomology process. But that's not the same as saying it's the same. That implies that it's 0 in here. Not the same thing, though. If it's 0 in here, then it will be zero in the Czech cohomology. And to be, to be for an element of, for one cocycle to be zero in the Czech cohomology is the same thing as saying that there exists a, a, a zero cycle, beta i, and these beta i's are on each ui in such a way that if I replace uh, the original section, if I modify, I, I, had, I had deformations over each ui. If I modify them by this beta i, then they will agree. Yeah, that's what it means to say there's a, say there's a, um, that it's a, and it's a zero as an element of H1. It says there exists a one chain, beta i's on the ui's. I use the beta i's on the ui's to modify the ui primes, and then they will cancel out the alpha i j's, because then beta i, what is it? Beta i minus beta j is equal to alpha i j on the intersections. I don't get my signs right, by the way. Okay, so actually, the vanishing of alpha as a co in H1 is the same as the vanishing here. That would, that would give us a one chain, which allows us to adjust the, the sections over the UI primes in such a way they do move. OK, so this, this is the main theorem. So let me state the result now. So the result is. So this says the following theorem. Let's let x0 in Pn over k be a closed subscheme. And suppose, given a deformation x over c, where c is an order ring, and suppose we give the sequence 0, j to c prime to c to 0, with uh, mj equals 0. And assume that uh, extensions of the deformation x over c exist locally over c prime. So locally means there exists a covering by small affine open subsets on each one of which there is an extension. Then, first of all, the set of all possible extensions, set of all extensions x prime over c prime of x over c is a torsor under the group h0 x0 uh, and j tensor in uh, x0 over pn. And secondly, there is an obstruction Sorry, the set of all such extensions is a torsor 
Uh, I should call it a pseudo torso. Okay. So, what is the pseudo torso? The pseudo torso is a set such that if you choose one element of the set, then all the others are given by the group G, but without any guarantee that the set is not empty. So, a pseudo torso is a set that might be empty, but if it's not empty, then it is when one to one corresponds to the group, as I said before. So, it's actually only a pseudo torso, but there's an obstruction alpha in H1 of X0 J tensor N of X0 over Pn, depending on X over C, such that alpha equals zero <laughs> if and only if there is a global extension. Now I see I didn't state this quite correctly. Uh, Part A does not need the assumption that extensions exist locally. Part A is still true. Even if extensions don't exist locally, it's still true that the set of all orders is pseudo torso. Uh, but for the existence, I have to assume that they exist locally, and then the obstruction tells me whether they exist locally. And I have not answered the question of what do you need to know for them to exist locally. I'll leave that, I'll leave that out for the time. Okay, so now this is, this is the typical pattern of what happens. This idea was doing for closed subschemes, but it's the typical pattern of what happens in any deformation problem. Usually, uh, the deformations over the dual numbers is given by some group, and then if you want to make extensions, there's going to be a local extension problem, and then if the local extension problem is solved, there's going to be an obstruction for the existence of a... Well, no, actually, even local case, it also may happen. There may be... There may be a, even a local obstruction, the local extension problem, you don't know whether they exist, there'll be an obstruction for existence. And once they exist, then the, the, the set of all will be a torso under some group. This is very typical. In this case, you'll notice that the set of them is given by H0 of J tensor N0, and the obstruction is an H1 of J tensor N0. Okay. Uh, now, in order to apply this theorem, to subschemes of projective space and, and studying the Hilbert scheme, which is what we're interested in, we need to worry about this hypothesis here. What about, what about this hypothesis of the extension six is this local? Well, they may not, but I'll tell you several hypotheses under which they do. So most, most of the time, they do exist locally. So let me just tell you a theorem there. So in order to be able to apply this theorem, we need to know when extensions this lo exist locally. And this doesn't depend on Pn at all, it just depends on ambient space, which is non-singular. So changing notation, let's let x be a non-singular projective variety over k. Let's let y be a closed subscheme, then um, extensions of deformations of Y as closed subscheme exist locally if either Y is locally complete intersection in X. So that means it's, it's defined by the right number of elements. The, the ideal is locally generated by a number of elements equal to the co-dimension. Or B, Y is locally co-Macaulay and Y has co-dimension 2 in X, or C, Y is locally Gorenstein, and Y has co-dimension 3 in X. So any one of these conditions will guarantee that locally extensions as closed subschemes exist. And I want, to, uh, I want to outline to you the proof of A, and I will leave proofs of B and C to the book. That's chapters uh, eight and nine, sections eight and nine, respectively, in the book, deal with lovely common code in dimension two and Gorenstein code dimension three.
So let me, let me give you the idea for why the local intersection case works. So it's a local question. So again, so suppose the situation is A is the polynomial ring and goes down to B, and we have an idea I. And now I'm assuming that the number of generators of I, so let's say F1 up to Fr, equals the co-dimension. I want to use I want to use letters X and Y for the for the for the schemes because it's easier to write the co-dimension of Y and X than to write the co-dimension of B and A. I hate writing the co-dimension of B and A. So uh, we assume that, well, it's the, if they're local rings, the difference in the dimensions of the local rings is equal to the number of uh, elements in the, in the generating set. So that means it's locally complete intersection. So supposing you have, um, this happens over X0. Now supposing you have, a, a, supposing you have let's call these zeros, I0. Supposing you have a, a deformation over over some local art in ring C, the point is that um, you, can just, you can just take these generators, F1 up to Fr, and lift them any old way you like, F1 prime up to Fr prime into A, and they will define something which is actually the right co-dimension of the flat and gives you an extension. In other words, and furthermore, any, any extension of this will have the property that the extension is defined by the right number of elements. You can't, again, say that this is a uh, locally complete intersection because uh, these, are not integral, these are not domains anymore. If these were domains, domains, for example, or that's a, that's a regular local ring. These aren't regular local rings anymore because they've got these nil points in them. But uh, to be flat, if it's going to be a flat extension, you lift and take any lifting of the thing and you get something good. Now, why does that need complete intersection? The point is that if you take R general polynomials, they'll define something of codimension R. If you had something in co-dimension R defined by R plus one general polynomial, that's fine. But if you vary the polynomials, then you get something in co-dimension R plus one. It's not flat. So it's essential that you have the, the right co-dimension. And then that's the general situation. The actual proof, you make use of that wonderful criterion for a locally complete intersection using the Kozul complex. You write down the Kozul complex of F1 to Fr, and the homology of that is zero if you don't know, complete intersection. Uh, if you don't know that, it's in Matsumura's book, Community of Algebra. Not, not the, no, no, not the community. What is it called? Community of Rings. Matsumura has two books. One is Community of Algebra, originally published by Benjamin, and then there's Community of Rings in Cambridge. I like the Cambridge book better. I think there you'll find this whole theory written out very nicely. So that's just a rough idea, but it's, uh, it's believable, right? You believe that? Yeah, it's easy. <laughs> now, for Colin McCauley and Gorsai, it's a little more complicated, but again, it depends on the fact that Code of College Convention 2 has a very nice uh, algebraic representation because uh, when you take a resolution, you've got a two step resolution, it's defined by two locally three sheaves together with a certain matrix, an uh, n by n minus one matrix. So any, any uh, locally Code of thing in Convention 2 is given by the uh, n by n minors of an n by n plus one matrix of polynomials. And then again, you can lift those guys any old way, and it'll work. You lift the matrix somehow. And for Gorenstein, co-dimension three, it's even slightly more complicated. Uh, there's a, there's a three-step, this is a paper of Eisenberg a long time ago. Um, Gorenstein ideal is given by the, the Fafians of a, what is it? Oh, what? what? Five by five. No, 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 not some, some number, not necessarily five. No, 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 not necessarily five. It's, an R, it's a message, it's an R rank matrix. Right. It's an R rank, rank Q symmetric matrix of R length, of R dimension, at least five. Right. And uh, you take the Fafians of that. Yeah, so again, you do the same sort of thing. You can show that once you have that situation, then you lift the matrix so that it's still a skew symmetric. And then the Fafians have worked as well. There's a bit of work to do. But I, that's all written down in the book, so you can see that in the book. So, let me give you a trivial application. Just to, you know, it's nice to have, a, nice to have a, a, an application that's easy to prove something. So I'll, I'll prove something you already know, but that creates some confidence that this is we're going in the right direction. Uh, oh, before I 
I do that, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. before I do that, let me tell you a very important consequence of the, the fact of when, you, when you're able to lift things and there's no obstructions. So, consequence. Uh, Suppose you have the Hilbert scheme. So I've got some closed set subscheme in Pn, and I've got the corresponding Hilbert scheme, and I've got the point h0 and h that corresponds to x. And what we showed the first day was that the, the h0 of the normal bundle in x and the normal bundle in x in Pn is equal to the Zariski tangent space of h at h0. Now what I want to show is that if, uh, what shall I say? If there exist local deformations, if there exist local extensions, so in other words, for example, any of those three projections, and if h1 of x and the normal bundle of x and pn is equal to zero, if the h1 is zero, we, we say there's no obstructions. So, in the case where you happen to have no obstructions, it follows that the corresponding Hilbert scheme is H is non-singular at the point H0. So this is a wonderful consequence. Just, just on, this, on this little bit of infinitesimal calculation, we can find out not only the Zariski tangent space, we prove it's non-singular. And if it's non-singular, then the Zariski tangent space has the dimension of H. So it's of, of, so it'd be of dimension equal to the H0. Okay, so the fact that no obstructions means that the corresponding thing is non-singular is pure local algebra. So here's what you do. Imagine, you see, here's the Hilbert scheme, <coughs> x over h. And every time, every time I get a deformation over some r degree a, because of the universal property of the Hilbert scheme, that's the same thing as having a, a homomorphism of the local ring OH0 to a, local homomorphism. Now, we start, with, uh, we start with just going to k, so we have the thing over k, and then the deformations the, over the dual numbers, over the dual numbers, we then have uh, the Zariski tangent space, but it's, I'll do them all at once. So if I take, what is it, if I take, if I take v equal to m mod m squared on h, just to find the vector space, m mod m squared, and then over here, take k of v modulo of v squared, so to speak. In other words, the vector space v, and then kill all the squares. So this is like the dual numbers, only it's now v-dimensional instead of v. And take the natural map of m mod m squared to v, and that defines for us uh, an extension over this ring here. So we now have an extension over a little Arden ring whose uh, m mod m squared is the same as h. Now, if there's no obstructions, then we can go on and we can extend it to k of v modulo v cubed, because the v squared mod v cubed will act as j. If there's no obstructions, so the extensions exist. And then we can extend it to k of v modulo v fourth, and so on. And then you take out all of these, and then take the completion, and we'll get a map from O of h, h0 completed into the formal power series of this vector space v. Okay, now what have you got here? This is one complete local ring. That's another complete local ring. We have a homomorphism, which induces an identity on m mod m squared. Um, that makes it surjective, first of all, because we landed on m mod m squared. And secondly, the dimension of this one, the dimension of any local ring is less than or equal to its risky tangent space. So this has dimension, dimension less than or equal to that dimension. This has dimension equal to surjective map. Well, it's an isomorphism. So the completion of H is then isomorphic to a form power series, and that makes OHH a regular local ring. Okay, so that's to say OH H0 is a regular. And my ground fields are always algebraic closed, not like some other people in this conference, uh, which makes the, 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 the H be smooth. Let's see, how's my time? Here? Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to give you, so this is, this is a wonderful application, so I want to give you a, uh, an actual calculation to show how this works. Uh, let's consider current conics in P2 again. Let's have an example. Conics. 
and two. So a conic, I'll call it C. Ah, C is now a conic. C over there was an Arnon ring, but this C is a conic. You're worried, Joe. No, 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 you're a little uncertain. <laughs> okay, C is a conic. So the normal bundle of C and P2 is OC of 2. Because it's defined by the ideal shape is I is O of minus 2, so the normal bundle is O of 2. And we saw earlier that if you look at H0 of C and OC of 2, C is isomorphic to P1, and S, S under the isomorphism of P1 is to P4, so this is equal to 5. So we saw that the risky tension space was 5. But now consider H1 of C and OC of 2. Uh, it's a rational curve, so this is, this is 0. So the fact that it's 0 means there's no obstructions, and therefore we've just proved that uh, P5 is smooth of dimension 5. You knew that already. Uh, so that's sort of a trivial example. Uh, I think in the exercises that I put on that sheet of paper, I asked you to do the same thing for the twisted cubic curve. So for the twisted cubic curve, uh, you want to compute the H0 as being 12 dimensional, and you want to show that H1 is 0, so that the Hyalbert scheme of twisted cubic curves will be smooth of uh, dimension 12, at least at points corresponding to smooth uh, twisted cubic curves. Now, it would be nice to see an example where the obstructions are not zero. Uh, and I haven't worked this one out, actually, but if you want to try one, uh, try in, 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 in P4, take a point and take the four coordinate axes. I don't know how to draw them. But if this, is, this is a four-dimensional space. These are the four coordinate axes. So this is a curve inside of P4. So it's co-dimension 3, and this is a non-Gorenstein point, if I remember correctly. And being a non-Gorenstein point, this here does not apply. So uh, there might be some obstructions. Uh, oh, wait a minute. What does that say? Oh, it just says that H1 is not the right thing for, for computing. Anyway, I don't quite know the answer, but you might mess around with this, with this thing here. Yeah? Well, what I really mean by when I say no obstructions is that whichever deformation problem we're talking about, whenever you have a deformation over Arden ring C and you try to extend it to Arden ring C prime, there are no obstructions to that. So, so, for example, if you took a completed Sluke intersection curve in P3 of yeah. degree, yeah. H1 would be non-zero, but you would say that there would be no obstructions. Oh, no, 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 no. In that case, the, the, oh, I see. The obstruction group is maybe non-zero. In fact, let me give one of those examples, oh. because that's, that's nice to have an example. Yeah, one more example. It's possible that the Hilbert scheme may be split, uh, but the, the H1 thing in question may be non-zero. Uh, you're right, I see. So the point is, when you say no obstructions, do you mean the Hilbert scheme is smooth, or do you mean that the, the obstruction group we're calculating is non-zero? That was exactly Ah, uh, yeah, okay, that's two different things. I should probably distinguish that terminology somehow. But anyway, give an example of that. Let's consider in P3, consider curves C of degree 4 and genus 3. Well, you should recognize instantly that any curve of degree 4 and genus 3 is actually a plane curve. So they actually lie in the plane like this. <clears throat> and how many of them are there? First of all, let's just count the dimension of the family. So in P2, a, a plane curve of degree 4 depends on, um, it's got 15 coefficients, so it's dimension 4, is that right? 14? <coughs> uh, it's a half B times B plus 3 times H1 plus 3, which is 4 times 7. Uh, yeah, it's a 14 dimensional family. The number, of, the number of, it's a binomial coefficient of, of 6 over 2, right? Yeah, OK, 15, take away 1. So the curves in the plane depend on 14 parameters, but the plane itself in P3 depends on, on 3 parameters. So we expect a Hilbert scheme of dimension 17. OK, so let's figure out, let's do the computation. So here's the curve C. So what is the normal bundle of C in P3? Well, it's made up out of two pieces. One is the normal bundle of C in P2, and the other is the normal of P2 in P3 restricted. Uh, Ah, 14 is the curve, is C in P2, and, and this is the number of P2s in P3. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm actually looking at P3. So I choose a plane, that's three parameters, and then 14, that makes 17. Okay, so there's a, 
any, any time you have a sur curve in the surface, it's a nice short exact sequence, the normal bundle of the curve in the surface is a subbundle of the normal bundle of the curve in P3. And the quotient is the normal bundle of the surface, P2 and P3, restricted to the curve. So this one is OC of 4, so it's a quarter curve, and this one is OC of 1. And in fact, in this case, it's a complete intersection of P2 with the quartic surface, so it's actually a direct sum. So this is the direct sum of OC of 4, direct sum of OC of 1. OK, so now we can compute H0. So H0 of the normal bundle. Let's see, H0 of over 4 is going to be, that one's non special because the, the um, canonical class omega c is equal to OC1. It's, it's, it's a canonical curve. So it's, this is 4 times 4 is 16, plus 1 minus the g which is 3, which is 14. So that's 14 plus an OC1. Well, OC of 1, it gets the sections from P2, there's three of those, is 3 is uh, 17. So sure enough, the Zariski Kanji space is dimension 17. What about H1? H1 again. Well, this one's not special. So it's 0 plus, this one's the canonical class. So H1 of the canonical class is, uh, that's H0, that's 1. 1? Yeah. All right, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here there's an interesting example. You see, the, the scheme is actually smooth at dimension 17, and yet the h1 is non-zero. And the other interesting thing is that 17 minus 1 is equal to 16, which is 4d. And it turns out, I'll, I'm, if I have time, in one of the later lectures, I'll show you that the Hilbert scheme of curves in P3 always has dimension at least equal to 4d. So uh, here's this number 4d that crops in. So either you can say there's no obstructions, or you can say that there is obstructions, depending on which, which language you're going to use. <laughs> All right. Oh, my time is almost up. OK. I was also going to do um, abstract. Maybe I'll just tell you the result of the abstract ones. Oh, so I didn't tell you how to tell whether there's local obstructions to closed subschemes. And the reason I didn't tell you is that almost all cases we want to cross satisfy A, B, or C. So we can ignore that. Yeah. But let me just say, without proofs then, what happens in the case of abstract schemes? Uh, oh, wait a minute. No, no, no. Before I do that, another application. This is a non-trivial application. Let's look in P2. And let's consider subschemes of dimension z equals 0, but the degree of z is some number d. Zero schemes of degree d. So for example, you could take d distinct points. But there's other ones. When the d points come together, they make some horrible little thing. It's like, it's like, a, it's like taking a local ring uh, and dividing out with some idea with co-length d. So they're really messy. So the things that, that are supported at a point are really messy. But uh, first of all, the point is, that we can compute the normal bundle. Normal bundle of z and p2, uh, whatever it is, uh, it's going to be, what is it? Can we compute that? Or maybe that's not so easy to compute. Ah, but never mind. Um, the point is that whatever the normal bundle is, it's a, bus, it's a bundle on a zero dimensional scheme. And therefore, it has no h1. h1 of n equals 0. And furthermore, this is, it may not be locally complete intersection, but it is co Macaulay in co-dimension 2. So our theorem applies. And therefore, uh, therefore, h1n equals 0 implies that the scheme, Hilbert scheme, is smooth. And actually, the dimension is 2d. You can guess the dimension because if you take d distinct points, they depend on 2d parameters. So the fact that this Hilbert scheme is smooth is a, a non-trivial fact. It's also connected, but this, this doesn't prove that it's connected for you. It's actually connected smooth. OK, but I did want to say, very briefly now, what happens for abstract deformations. Can you push that to points in P3? Sorry? Can you push that to points in P3? No. no. For points in P3, uh, it is known that the Hilbert scheme is not necessarily smooth. And uh, the first example, first example is a little zero scheme sitting at one point of length 103 or so. 
That's in P4. That's in P4. Yeah, yeah. That's Daniel Ehrman. Yeah. In P4, there's a very nice example of length eight. So there's a little zero scheme of length eight in P4 that is actually generic on an irreducible component of the Hilbert scheme that is not in the closure of sets of distinct forms. Okay. So what happens for abstract deformations of abstract uh, schemes? So the local situation is the deformations are determined by uh, if, if a ring B by this function D T1 of B over K that I talked about last time. So that's the, the local deformations. And the local obstructions are in something of T2. I didn't define T2 too for you, but there's also a T2 function. So in the local case, you have <coughs> deformations determined by some T1, and the obstructions are determined by another group called T2. But the nice case of the global case, let's assume that x is non-singular. If x is non-singular, then this t1 and the t2 are both 0. So there's no local obstructions. And what happens is that if you want to, if you, if you want to, so you've got a, you've got a, you've got a big x here. Over each open, e over each small affine, there's no obstructions. So there exist, first of all, there exist deformations, and secondly, they're all trivial. So over ui, you get ui prime is a trivial deformation. And then over ui uh, intersect uj, you have two trivial deformations. So what's the difference between two trivial deformations? It's an automorphism. So you get something which is automorphism. You get something that often you get an alpha ij in automorphism. The automorphisms are sections of t0, which is the tandem tangent model, h0 of uij t0, which is the tangent model. And these give rise to, uh, let me see now, which way does it go? These give rise to, oh yeah, if you glue them together, you get, you get, a, you get a, an alpha in H1. I think I did that last time, of X and the tangent bundle. And this determined, this is the tangent space to the deformations. Now, what about the obstruction? If you're given, some, some, if you're given something over C, I'll just say it in words, if you're given something in C, then we're assuming there's no local obstructions. So over each of you UI, you get a local extension. And then over u i intersect j, you have two local extensions. So um, the difference, the difference is the principal homogeneous space under, under this h1. Uh, and on the intersection of three of them, oh yeah, on the intersection of three of them, it's not zero anymore, it's an automorphism. So on the intersection of three of them, you get, you get a section of the tangent bundle. So the up upshot of this is the final obstructions land in h2 of x with the tangent bundle. That's the instructions of global deformations. And uh, a nice application of that, which I can say in one minute, is that um, if you have an algebraic curve, C is a curve, there's no H2. There's no obstructions. So therefore, the, the, modulized, the modulized space is smooth. Oops, no, no, I can't say that. There is no modulized space. But if there was a modulized space, it would be smooth of dimension 3g minus 3. And maybe perhaps one of the more subtle efforts of, of the deformation theory is to make sense of the, of the expression quotes the modulized spaces through smooth of dimension 3g minus 3, even if it doesn't exist. Nevertheless, this information is solid information. This local copy is perfectly solid. And we can make sense of that. And it means something. And it means something that's sort of like the modulized space, if there was one, is smooth. Another good application of this is the so-called lifting problem. You're given a variety of characteristic P, and you want to find out if you can find a family of varieties to find over the integers or some number ring uh, which, which come from characteristic 0. And again, for curve, there's no obstructions. So the answer is yes. Any curve, non-singular projective curve to find over uh, a field of characteristic P can be put into a family of of things to find over a ring of mixed characteristic so that it has a characteristic 0 version and its reduction mod P is that one. Okay, so I stopped for the